Hello, everyone, and welcome to uh, week nine. And uh, in this particular module, we're going to be talking about the concept of nuisance, which is one of the uh, torch topics we're covering in this unit. Now, before I start talking about this particular subject or topic, I'd like to, uh, of course, you'd be aware of it, but I'd like to uh, commend you for the fact that you're still in the unit and it's now week nine and we're very close to finishing this unit. And before you know it, you know, you would have um, completed this unit in the next uh, three weeks. Um, to me, it's a, a great journey on your part, mainly because as you would have known, torts used to be taught in, uh, in two terms. So there was torts A and there, then there was torts B. Uh, and it was taught as a, sec as a year two unit, but there has been a change so that for the first time this year, and for the first time in the LOS program at CQU, uh, TORTS is now taught as a single unit, and it was even taught uh, as a first year unit. And so instead of having to uh, go through the entire textbook across two terms, you had to do it in one term. And so that's an amazing accomplishment for you to have you know, gone this far. So I commend you. And uh, you know, I, I feel confident that at this point, you would have learned a lot about TORTS and by the time you complete the unit, you know, you have a very strong sense of what torts is and how it relates uh, in civil society and how it can help you in your future career as a lawyer or solicitor in, uh, in Australia. So we're gonna be talking about, about nuisance. Uh, nuisance, the topic we're covering today, uh, it's not about uh, people who are being nuisance. You know, uh, you can have people who are annoying, they do stuff you don't like, uh, they can be nuisance but that's not what we're talking about here. And in fact, this is in a sense, a deviation from the topics we've been focusing on before, because in the past eight weeks, we've really focused on uh, torts against persons, whether or not it's torts based on negligence or it's torts based on intentional uh, actions committed by a particular tort user or defendant. Our focus uh, in this particular uh, module is looking at the torts of nu nuisance. And what we need to learn is that nuisance as a concept uh, in the law of torts really pertains to certain property rights that uh, property owners or those who might have rights to property have as a result of, um, as a result of those property rights. And as we see later on, the, uh, the law of nuisance uh, protects the the property owner or those who have rights over property to ensure that their enjoyment and you or use of the land uh, is not or use of property is not interfered with or that there is no material damage to the to the property that they have so the focus here is really on uh, trying to protect the recognized property rights of uh, certain individuals so that's going to be the focus of uh, nuisance it can, nuisance is actually in a sense uh, pretty important because we all live in, in our own homes, right? And, and when we do, uh, we, because we live in our own homes, we do have certain property rights, whether we become we're property owners or uh, we're, we're perhaps uh, le uh, lessees of, uh, or tenants of certain properties. And as a result, we have, recognized, we have rights recognized under the law. But at the same time, we also have neighbors who have also have their own rights. And uh, these neighbors of ours may be uh, committing acts or doing certain things that in a sense may interfere with our own property rights, such as, you know, you might have a neighbor who regularly mows his lawn uh, and he might be doing it at, I don't know, four o'clock in the morning where, while you're still sleeping, or he might be doing it late at night after he comes home from work. And not only, could his actions interfere with your with the enjoyment of your own property, meaning your own home? It might be that as he mows the lawn, he doesn't have one of those catchers, which means that there might be a lot of dust and a lot of grass and perhaps perhaps dust pollen that then you know uh, spread uh, to your part of the house, which causes you allergies, or can uh, you know uh, make your swimming pool dirty if if you had one. And so the question then is, in these instances, would that be a nuisance? Uh, it, can, it can also happen that you might have a neighbor who's, uh, I don't want to be racist here, but you might have a neighbor who, who cooks food and the odor from the food is not something that you're used to and it can be to you unpleasant. Would that mean that there might be a nuisance there? Uh, it might also mean that you, you, you have a neighbor who 
who enjoys playing basketball uh, or whose, whose son might be playing basketball late at night and it and you know you live just next door across his house and the noise interferes with your sleep it can also mean that uh, you you might have a a neighbor who loves to play the guitar probably even have a a loud speaker system involved just you know to to um to, to make the entire neighborhood learn about the, the good music he, he thinks he plays or somebody who plays drums. And again, in these instances, that raises the question is of whether or not there is a, an act, a simple action that you as a potential plaintiff can commence by, by claiming that there is an interference with your use and enjoyment of, of, your, of your property. And so that's the focus of uh, our topic today. Now, I, I need to point out at this stage, at this very early stage, that it is possible that there might be certain states that might have particular uh, laws that govern issues about zoning, about you know, the use of uh, noise and so on. There might especially be council, local council rules that talk about these things. For the moment, our focus is, is uh, really on the common law of torts. And so try we, we, for, for us to be able to truly learn and, and uh, become very familiar with the basic principles of the law of nuisance, it's important for us not to uh, get confused by trying to uh, rely on what we might know from our own personal experience about local council rules or uh, you know th that type of stuff that govern uh, rules about neighborhood relations and so on. So we're going to be looking at the common law of torts in this topic. So at the end of this module, you should be able to explain the differences between the two actions of nuisance. So you have private nuisance and you have public nuisance. Identify factual scenarios to which the separate actions of public and private nuisance arise and apply relevant legal principles and briefly explain the remedies and defenses available to actions in private and public nuisance. So let's get going. Now, in the case of Hargrave versus Goldman, the High Court through Justice Wendeer uh, said that private nuisance involves an unlawful interference with a person's use or enjoyment of land or of some right over or in connection with it, in connection with the land. So. We will notice, therefore, that private nuisance essentially involves unlawful interference. So there might be interference in a sense, but the interference might be lawful in the sense that uh, you, can, you can really say that, oh, my neighbor shouldn't be mowing his lawn because, you know, my house gets dusty. It puts a lot of dust on my patio or, 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 or my windows. There is some interference that is expected in daily life. The question is, is it an unlawful interference? So that's something we're examining today. And we, we see later on that when you speak of private nuisance, it's not just about the unlawful interference with the person's use or enjoyment of land. There's a second category of private nuisance. And that's when the unlawful interference by another uh, will lead to material damage to, to your property. And so we're gonna be looking at that as well. Now, the crucial point though, when we talk of private nuisance, it is always connected to the ownership of private property or a right that you might have to private property. You don't have to be the owner, as, I, as we said, you could be the, the lawful occupier, you could be the tenant, and as a result, you will have certain rights over the property. Uh, in that case, we're just talking of private nuisance, we're not talking yet of public nuisance. Because as we learn later on, uh, when you speak of public nuisance, there really isn't any requirement that for you to, be, to succeed as a plaintiff, you don't really have to show that you are the owner of a particular property. Okay, but anyway, going back to private nuisance, uh, so it, it has to be connected to the ownership uh, or lawful occupation occupation or possession of private property. And so in other words, without some kind of property right in or over the land affected by the interference, the plaintiff cannot sue, okay? So if you're just a mere licensee, in other words, you know, you've just been permitted uh, to be in a property, but you're not there with a, with a legal right that, uh, with that can be asserted uh, in law, either because you're an owner or you're, you are a lawful occupier or tenant, then you cannot sue. So you need to have a property right over the land. So uh, we briefly talked about private nuisance. As I mentioned, there is also a public nuisance. It's public because it doesn't just affect you as an individual. It does in fact in, affect in a sense, the public at large. So a nuisance uh, 
becomes a public nuisance when it becomes so widespread in its range or it is indiscriminate in its effect that it has an impact on the public at large. Now, it, it, now we realize, of course, that if there is a public nu nuisance, if there is an unlawful interference uh, with the enjoyment or use of property, for example, it does uh, potentially mean that uh, it can have a disproportionate effect across the public. In other words, some will be more greatly uh, inconvenienced. There will be more who will, be, who will suffer greater harm. There will be others who suffer less. And the question then is, uh, one of the questions that we ask and we examine today will be, who then is able to uh, file an action if there is a public nuisance? Now, in general, if it is a public nuisance, it should be bought, brought by the attorney general on behalf of the public rather than by a private individual. However, as we see later on in this uh, lecture video, in li limited circumstances, individuals uh, do have a, a right to uh, file an action on the basis of a public nuisance. So, as I mentioned, there are two types of uh, private nuisance. One involves the interference with the use and enjoyment of property rights. And the second uh, involves material damage to the property. Now, we will see uh, shortly that when we talk about material damage to the property, for example, if your uh, property is material damage necessarily, uh, you would think that there isn't an interference with the use and enjoyment of property rights. So you might say that, uh, you know, uh, if there's an interference with user and prop enjoyment of property rights, that is nuisance, but it can go to such an extent that there's also material damage to property. Uh, for example, if there's just noise and vibrations and dust that, you know, interferes with your use and enjoyment of property rights, that's already private nuisance. But it can also be, it can also be, po it's also possible that the odors and the dust might lead to uh, harm or damage to your property because there might be chemicals that you know, can, can destroy your plants or roses or, you know, part of maybe the roof and so on. And this can happen um, in, in areas where there might be a manufacturing plant, which uh, then has uh, certain, has smoke. And when uh, some of the smoke might actually have certain uh, chemicals that solidify, and they may end up, you know, um, falling on the property of another and causing material damage to property. So, uh, when you speak of private nuisance, therefore, there are at least two types. And there's a reason for this difference in a short while, because as we see, if there's material damage to property, there are certain rules about onus of uh, evidence, as well as issues about strict liability. So there is strict liability on the part of a tortfeasor or somebody who causes the private nuisance if it leads to material damage to property, as we discussed in a short while. But it's important in any event to know that you know material damage is in fact a, a uh, any, a, a way by which there is an interference with the use and enjoyment of property rights. So they're pretty much related. Although not every uh, interference with the use and enjoyment of property rights, rights necessarily leads to material damage. Okay, so one of the earliest cases that involves uh, issues about private nuisance was the case of St. Helens, smelting company and tipping. Uh, in this case, the, the defendant's factory damaged the trees on the plaintiff's estate. Uh, and the question is, would that be a nuisance? Uh, the, now, now, we need, before we even think about it, we need to remember that you can't really prevent a factory from operating in a residential area. And again, for the moment, you know, ignore uh, zoning laws and enjoy, uh, ignore lo local ordinances. But the point is, if you are a homeowner and you have certain property rights, surely, companies and businesses that want to put up factories also have certain property rights. And therefore it's a question of, you know, trying to have a balance uh, between the rights of homeowners and the rights of other property owners, including businesses that may run factories uh, and, you know, manufacturing plants, which can potentially have pollution either in the form of noise or smoke or, you know, some other uh, ways by which uh, pollution happens. And we need to learn to live with, it, with you know, with these uh, conditions we need to live with discomfort. We can't say that, you know, um, you're causing me discomfort, therefore I, I will sue you. That's not uh, permitted by, 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 by the courts. So we need to learn to live with a certain amount of discomfort. So in the case of St. Helens Melting Company and Tipping, the court said that 
The submission which is required from persons living in society to that amount of discomfort, which may be necessary for the legitimate and free exercise of the trade of their neighbors, would not apply to circumstances, the immediate result of which is sensible injury to the value of the property. So what the court is essentially saying is that uh, we would expect that if you live in society, we all have to experience a certain amount of discomfort. Uh, from the necessary activities uh, and necessary and legitimate and free activities of business of our neighbors. Now that is permissible, that is not nuisance. However, when those activities, when the exercise of those activities then lead to uh, injury to the value of their property, to, our, to the value of our property, then there would be nuisance. In this case, the reason why the court felt that there was a nuisance was that it damaged the trees on the plaintiff's estate. Uh, we're gonna be examining situation scenarios as well where the activities of a neighbor indeed, uh, you know, cause damage to um, the activities, the business of another, uh, but there was no nuisance in that regard. We're gonna be examining that in a short while. Now, so as I mentioned earlier, when you look at private nuisance and we said there were two kinds, the difference really relates to one of degree. So it's about the damage to plaintiff's property. So the damage to plaintiff's property is every damage to a plaintiff's property is necessarily uh, an interference with, this, with the use and enjoyment of the property, as we said. So it's kind of a spectrum uh, from just mere interference uh, with the enjoyment and use of property to immaterial damage to property. But in a sense, they're you know uh, they're they're really one and the same, except that the, the there is a greater ma magnitude of harm to a plaintiff when there is material damage to property. So again, the important thing is when you speak of interference, uh, when you speak here of nuisance, it involves interference with uh, property rights, either with the use or enjoyment of property. So the basic question then is, given the fact that in civil, in civil society or in, in everyday life, we do need to expect, and we have learned to expect that there will be some sort of discomfort and inconvenience in living in a place where we have neighbors. In, this, in the same way that we have to tolerate the activities of our neighbors, our neighbors likely also have to tolerate our own activities and to a great extent also have to uh, live with the discomfort of, of being with us uh, as a result of our own activities, even though they impact to a great extent on their enjoyment and use of their property. The question then is, if there's some interference, is the interference unreasonable. So the question is, it's not so much the fact that the, there is interference. The question is, is that kind of interference reasonable or not? So the court then do, does a balancing between the plaintiff's desire to use and enjoy his or her property with the interference against the defendant's own desire to undertake certain activities and also perhaps use his, uh, his or uh, use and enjoy his or her own property, which may lead to uh, interference with, with that of uh, your, your, your own. Now, the question therefore of um, what is unreasonable interference, that is actually determined to a great extent by certain factors such as locality, uh, extent, duration, and magnitude of the interference. But let's begin with one of them, question of locality, meaning the, the, the situs or the, where it is located. So the important point, follow the case of Sturgis versus Bridgman, and we're gonna be looking at this in greater detail as a case in a short while, is that what might be unreasonable interference with the use and enjoyment of property in one neighborhood would not necessarily be so in another. So in other words, uh, if you live in a rural area, uh, why, what might be uh, reasonable interference in an urban area might not be reasonable interference in a rural area. So, you know, uh, loud noise and loud music and perhaps even dust might be reasonable interference in an urban area, but not in a rural area. Or it might be that, you know, uh, bad odors or aromas in a rural area might be considered to be reasonable interference, but perhaps maybe not in an urban area, especially if the aroma and odors might, you know, come from, uh, from factories, uh, which because of you know the heavy smell and odor might material co materially cause damage to your property or uh, can be considered to be 
such an extent of interference that you can say that uh, it does lead to a diminution to the value of your property. So in the case of Sturgis versus Richmond, the court said that whether anything is a nuisance or not is a question to be determined, not merely by an abstract uh, consideration of the thing itself, but in reference to its circumstances. So what would be a nuisance in Belgrade Square in the UK would not necessarily be so in Bermondsey. So in the case of uh, Sturgis versus Richmond, there are two parts to, uh, to, to this, um, to this uh, case. So it involved a, a uh, doctor being in an, in, in, in a, in an area where uh, there was a confectioner's premises, meaning somebody was running a business uh, making and preparing confectionery, you know, um, sugary products and sweets and so on. And of course, because it was uh, the, the, because the defendant had a confectioner's premises, there would necessarily be noise and that vibration from, from the operation of, of certain machines. Um, the doctor had been there uh, for quite a while. He didn't complain. Uh, so, you know, that was the neighbor. However, at some point, the doctor decided to build an extra room, and it was only when he built an extra room that was adjoined, that adjoined the, which was closer to the confectioner's premises, did he then complain about nuisance because the noise and vibration uh, was such that <clears throat> in the new, <clears throat> in the extra room, there was just too much noise and vibration. The question was, was there nuisance? And so, uh, uh, as we already said, in this particular case, uh, the court said that, you know, uh, what might be nuisance in one place might not be nuisance in another. But the question here really is, what if the plaintiff came to the nuisance? So here, the plaintiff did came to the nuisance by extending his consulting rooms into an area where the defendant's activity had already created an existing interference. So it had already been there. But the, that fact, the court said, was irrelevant to the outcome of the case. So it doesn't matter if you came to the nuisance. The, inf the important factor, therefore, was not who was there first, whether it was a plaintiff or the defendant, but rather what was the nature of the area at the time that the plaintiff complained. So um, you might have a, a uh, golf course, uh, and you know, if you play golf or if you have been in a, in a golf club, you would notice sometimes that there would be golf balls that run awry and you know they may cross the street they may uh, go somewhere else and which is the reason why a lot of the uh, golf clubs and golf courses which are near roads they'd have you know these trees or they'd have uh, huge uh, wire meshes to protect the public from errant balls and so on the question then is you know in those scenarios for example what if you decide to uh, construct a house near one of these golf courses and what while there wouldn't have been a problem before because there was no house what if you then have a house and then your house gets hit by the ball can you complain of nuisance and so because in that case it can be a let it can be claimed by the defendant that you were the one who came to the nuisance because you know the golf course had always been there and balls had always been uh, have got had gone awry or were errant and so on but under the ruling of Sturgis versus Bretchman, it doesn't matter, even if the plaintiff came to the nuisance. Now, in the case of um, Fiener uh, versus Domatschuk, uh, there were strong and unpleasant smells emanating from the mushroom farm in an area described as rural residential and zoned non-urban. Now, agricultural uses were permissible even without the consent of the planning authority but this was considered to be a nuisance, especially because of the strong and unpleasant smells. So that the interference there of uh, the enjoyment of uh, and use of property was considered to be unreasonable. In the case of uh, Monroe versus Southern Darius Limited, uh, it wasn't an, an it was no defense for the defendant to argue that her or his activities benefit the public. The important question really is simply whether or not those activities cause an unreasonable interference in the particular locality in which they occur, regardless of any beneficial, beneficial effects that they may also have. So I mentioned that one of the factors, I already said that one of the factors that has to be considered uh, in, in trying to determine whether or not the, the interference with the use and enjoyment of property uh, might be reasonable. One of the things we need to consider is locality because what might be 
reasonable interference in one locality might be a reasonable interference in, the, in another locality. But another, some of the other important factors to consider would be the duration, time, frequency, and extent. So the duration, time, frequency, and extent of the interference of the plaintiff's use and enjoyment uh, of his property or her property are factors that are also weighed against one another in determining whether that interference is unreasonable. So in the case of Wary versus KB Hutcherson Proprietor Limited, there was a construction site. There was a construction work going on at the site in the CBD, which affected the plaintiff solicitor's office. Was there a private nuisance? Now we will see that the, there was only private nuisance during those times uh, that were happening. Um, so noise and vibration of construction caused nuisance during ordinary office hours, but not outside those times. So if it was during office hours, even if there was noise and vibration from the construction, that wouldn't be considered to be uh, a private nuisance, but outside of those times, there would be. So that tells you that uh, what might that, you know, private, the same uh, nuisance might be considered to be uh, unreasonable interference, and at other times it will be considered to be reasonable interference, given the fact that we need to live with some kind of some discomfort with others. In the case of uh, Andrea versus Selfridge and Company Limited, so there was a demolition and construction work that was carried out during the night which interfered with the plaintiff's uh, hotel business. So they were in, in one island and the night construction, the, the plaintiff claimed that the night construction uh, interfered with his uh, hotel business. The court held that that constituted a nuisance because what was otherwise reasonable was unreasonable at the time. So it was the construction and demolition work which was carried out during the night that was considered to be a nuisance. But if it was done during the day, that wouldn't be nuisance. So uh, again, uh, if you had a neighbor who mows his lawn during the day, even you know, even if it's noisy, even if there's so much dust, if it's usually done during the times when people are expected to do it, you know, uh, to mow the lawn, that wouldn't be considered to be unreasonable interference. But if your neighbor had a habit of mowing his lawn every day, perhaps at two o'clock in the morning, uh, that might be considered to be nuisance. But again, and I mentioned again. Uh, for the moment, ignore your knowledge about uh, local ordinances or local laws. We're just focusing on laws uh, formulated under the common law or by the courts. So what it also means is that interference with the plaintiff's use and enjoyment of property will not be unreasonable if the plaintiff is unduly sensitive to interference. So we all have different levels and capacities for interference, right? Some of us can perhaps um, accept, uh, you know, high levels of interference. Others are not. Uh, others are not able to. It doesn't matter. The important thing is that if a plaintiff is unduly sensitive to interference, it will not have to mean that the interference is unreasonable because the standard is not the base. The basis of what is unreasonable is not a standard, a subjective standard of a plaintiff who is unduly sensitive to interference. In Robinson versus Culvert, uh, the plaintiff here had leased uh, storage space on an upper floor for paper and twine. The problem, however, was that uh, the paper and twine became useless because the defendant below, uh, you know, in, engaged in paper manufacturing, uh, which led to hot air being uh, emitted and the emitted hot air ruined or made useless the, the paper and twine. So the plaintiff complained that this was a nuisance. But the court said that a man who carries on an exceptionally delicate trade cannot complain because it is injured by his <clears throat> neighbor doing something lawful on his property if it is something which would not injure anything but an exceptionally delicate, delicate trade. So if, if, you're, if, if you will notice, you know, if it were somebody else <clears throat> leasing leasing the property, and it, it did involve you know uh, paper and twine, then perhaps the business wouldn't have been affected. So this was a just a bit sensitive. Uh, the plaintiff was just a bit more sensitive 
to uh, the hot air that was emitted from the defendant's paper manufacturing plant below. But the court said that there is no nuisance in this instance. In the case of Marsh versus uh, Baxter, uh, the plaintiff complained that uh, he, it, it had been, uh, it was in the business of um, producing or growing genetically, uh, uh, it was in the business of growing organic grains and flowers and it, had, it received certification from an independent body that it was growing organic grains and flowers. However, uh, it also had a neighbor uh, another business that uh, engaged in the in the production of genetically modified canola swads. The problem, however, is that some of the some of these canola seeds then um, were blown over to the property of the plaintiff, and so therefore, you know, you had the intermingling of genetically modified canola with organic grains and flowers, which led to the certification as an organic uh, farm uh, being uh, revoked by the certifier. The question is, was there nuisance? And the court said, no, there was no nuisance because a person who puts their land to an abnormally sensitive use cannot thereby unilaterally enlarge their own rights and obtain a higher right to limit the operations of their neighbors than someone who does not put their land to such a use. Now, so we've said that, uh, you know, malice, uh, we, we said that uh, locality, duration, time, frequency, and extent determine whether or not the interference is unreasonable. The other uh, factor that is considered by the court is whether or not there is malice, because if there is malice with the uh, interference committed by a defendant, then that will make the interference necessarily unreasonable. So malice on the part of the defendant re renders unreasonable an interference that might otherwise be reasonable. So a defendant who uses his or her property maliciously to cause interference cannot be guard, regarded as having acted reasonably. So in the case of Christie versus Davy, again, a very old case in 1893, uh, the, the defendant had a neighbor who gave music lessons and apparently uh, in a semi-detached semi -detached house. And apparently, you know, their music lessons, there will be some amount of noise. Um, the, the defendant was pretty unhappy with this and because the plaintiff wouldn't stop and the, you know, the, the music bothered the defendant, what he did was to retaliate by beating on trays and making lots of noise. Okay, question is, is there nuisance? The other, the answer, uh, was there nuisance on the part of the defendant for beating, beating on the trays and making lots of noise? The answer is yes, because it was not a legitimate use of the defendant's house to use it for the purpose of vexing and annoying his neighbor. So the point there as well is that if the, if, if the defendant did, if, you know, if there was music there and he decided I might as well use drums and play the music to the tune of what was being played in the plaintiff's house. So he made noise of his own, but it was, you know, because it wasn't out of malice, there wouldn't be, uh, there wouldn't be uh, nuisance in that particular case. So the, we, we need to go back to the point, when we speak of nuisance, we said that it, uh, it, it deals with the interference uh, with the use and enjoyment of property rights. So it's about property rights, but it also has to be recognized property rights, uh, which, and we will examine this shortly, is there a, a property right uh, to the invasion of uh, privacy within your property? So if you know if if you're used to uh, perhaps sunbathing or and or swimming uh, in your pool uh, in your bikini, and you then have a neighbor who who you know who who likes to watch you. Would that be a an invasion of privacy? You know that type of thing. So, but one of the first cases that we should be examining is the case of. Uh, so, this is not about the right to privacy itself that we're looking at. It's a right to privacy as part of a property right. Okay, so that's the 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 um, the limited scope of right to privacy that we're looking at here as part of the property right. So. In the case of Victoria Park Raising and Recreation Grounds Company Limited versus Taylor, 
apparently Victoria Racing, the paint pipe racing, you know, engages in racing of its horses. What the what the first defendant did was then to put up a platform in his own garden to watch the races. Question one: Is that a nuisance? Because the effect is, you know, he could have earned money from he couldn't earn money anymore from that in the, from that neighbor who because he doesn't have to go to the to the racehorses. And worse, what if that neighbor then invites friends to to look over, uh, you know, the race and perhaps even charge money? Would that be nuisance? Now, what was worse was that the defendant then um, uh, entered into a contract with the second defendant who would then make a radio broadcast about what was going on in the race. So that compounded uh, the, the complaint of the plaintiff. Not only was somebody uh, watching the race with a pain, he now had somebody who, uh, a radio announcer who then made a, provided a broadcast, a live broadcast, over the radio about what was going on in the race, which the claim plaintiff said de diminished uh, their commercial revenues or the revenues. And the court said that the interference must relate to the enjoyment of recognized property rights arising from the occupation of property. And if so, it forms a legitimate head of damage, uh, recover for the wrong, but it is not the wrong itself. So here, the court said that there was no nuisance uh, that was committed by the, by the, uh, by the defendant because uh, there is no uh, interference of the right of the plaintiff to the enjoyment and use of his property by the actions of the defendant in putting up a platform to watch the races and then hiring a defendant, uh, not a radio, a radio broadcaster to broadcast uh, what was going on in the races. There was no nuisance in that sense because there is no recognized property right uh, in relation to the claim that uh, others should be prohibited from watching the races even though they are in an adjoining property. And in the case of uh, Deep Cliff Proprietor Limited versus Council of the City of Gold Coast, the plaintiff claimed that parking restrictions created by the defendant had caused inconvenience to potential customers at plaintiff's restaurant, which affected the plaintiff's business. The question was, was there nuisance? And the court said that the parking restrictions may have caused some inconvenience to some patrons of the shopping center and restaurant affecting the volume of business and even repeat business. But no one was prevented from gaining access to the shopping center and restaurant. So this inconvenience does not amount to an interference of the plaintiff's enjoyment of their land. So in other words, there is no recognized property right uh, to, 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 the, to the parking area that might be close to a plaintiff's property. In the case of Shogun uh, Investments Proprietor Limited versus Public Transport Authority of Western Australia, there was a plan on the part of the defendant to uh, remove the right turn lane. The effect, however, was that if the right turn lane was removed, it would adversely affect the, plane, the, the uh, ability of the customers of the plaintiff to access the car park. Would the removal then uh, of the right turn lane amount to a private nuisance? That was the legal issue. And the court held that the removal of the lane would not amount to a private nuisance because private nuisance does not extend to protecting a person's right to carry on a business from their land. Here, the interest being sought to be protected by the plaintiff is in reality the plaintiff's interest in the continuing viability of its business. It was about, the interest here was about the continuing viability of its business, that it continued to make a lot of money. Not its interest, not its interest protectable as a right under private nuisance in the mere use and enjoyment of its land. So what was being sought to be protected was not the use and enjoyment of the land, but the, but the claimed interest of the plaintiff in having a continuing vi viable business that is not protected by the loss of nuisance. So here there was no nuisance because the, uh, the, the plaintiff could continue to use and enjoy its land. Now, I mentioned earlier, is there such a thing as unjustified invasion of property as part of a, uh, a, as a, part of a uh, property right? I said, uh, the example I gave was that you have a neighbor who, you know, who enjoys uh, looking over uh, 
uh, your own property while you're sunbathing or um, swimming in the pool. Uh, let, let's not examine, you know, um, criminal laws as well. Let's just focus on the law of torts here. Is there a tort of unjustified invasion of property as privacy as part of a property right? So in, in, the, in the case of Victoria Park Racing and Recreation Grounds Company Limited uh, versus Taylor, we had already said that uh, the, the, we had already said that the interference must relate to the enjoyment of recognized rights arising from the occupation of, of property. Does it mean, therefore, that uh, Australia does not recognize a tort of unjustified invasion of privacy? In a sense, uh, it, although it wasn't claimed in the case of Victoria Park, the plaintiff could have claimed that there was a, an unjustified invasion of privacy. Of course. Uh, that couldn't really be claimed in that scenario because it wasn't a, it wasn't privacy as we know it. It was a very public event. But the the the, the more uh, the broader question that should be asked is whether or not Australia recognizes a new sort of unjustified invasion of privacy. In general, the answer is no. However, in Australian Broadcasting Corporation versus Lander Games, Meets Proprietor Limited, the court said. Is, was open to the idea, the High Court was open to the idea of perhaps an unjustified invasion of privacy, but that is not yet settled law in Australia. But here, the High Court was signaling that it was open to the idea. And it said, the Victoria Park decision does not stand in the path of the development of a cause of action for unjustified invasion of privacy because the plaintiff in Victoria Park, Park was not seeking, a privacy, seeking privacy in the sense of seeking seclusion from surveillance and communication of what surveillance reveals. Now, there is, however, some authority for the proposition that deliberate violation of plaintiff's privacy may amount to a nuisance. So it has to be deliberate violation. So here in the case of Rossiti versus Hughes, uh, what the plaintiff did was to uh, install uh, motion activated video cameras in his backyard which would then uh, permit him to record what was happening uh, uh, in the plaintiff's backyard. So it was the defendant who had put uh, motion activated video cameras. Now we know as a general rule that what one can see, one can photograph. So there is no privacy, there is no right to privacy in that sense. So if you're out in the public and somebody takes your photos, that person taking a photo does not have to ask your permission because there is no right to privacy, okay, in general. So, but here, given the fact that the defendant had um, installed motion activated video cameras, which allowed him to deliberately snoop and surveil his neighbor, that was considered uh, to be uh, a nuisance because it involved a just, an unjustified invasion of privacy. So although there is at this point, uh, really no uh, common law uh, about the unjustified invasion of privacy as part of a property right, but that law does, is, is not absolute in the sense that it would not allow a defendant to deliberately snoop on the privacy of a neighbor. Okay, so if you have a neighbor who has a, you know, a video camera trained towards your bedroom, uh, that would be, uh, in the case of, following the case of Rosetti versus Hughes, that would be unjustified invasion of privacy. But if your neighbor uh, just happens to be, you know, a person, uh, perhaps a male, who enjoys looking over uh, his property and, you know, while you're sunbathing or swimming in your pool, uh, that would not amount to an unjustified uh, invasion of privacy because he has a right to your neighbor would have a right to uh, the enjoyment and use of his property. And that will probably include the right to have a good view of, you know, uh, of um, what's out there. Now, there's also some authority, however, that from the viewpoint of the plaintiff, what can be seen from the plaintiff's property may constitute unreasonable interference with the plaintiff's use and enjoyment of the property itself. So in the case of Thompson Schwab versus Kostaki, the plaintiff complained that he often saw prostitutes going in and out of houses in the neighboring uh, defendant's house. And this constituted a, uh, a private nuisance. Neighboring defendant's house, okay. In the case of Laws versus Florian Place Limited, 
the plaintiff complained that there was a uh, sex shop near the plaintiff's house and uh, this interfered with his use and enjoyment of the property. Uh, the court said that that was a nuisance. So for the most part so far, we've talked about private nuisance. Uh, the, first, the first kind of private nuisance which involved the unlawful interference with the use and enjoyment of a property. Uh, we're now gonna be talking about private nuisance uh, involving material damage to property. Uh, we said earlier already that material damage does involve an interference with the use and enjoyment of a property. I mean, if your property is material damaged, certainly there is an interference uh, with, with your property, with your enjoyment and use of your property. Material damage here is, is considered a, as a separate uh, kind of private nuisance, mainly because it can often involve uh, notions of strict liability and shift the burden of proof that what the action is, is uh, reasonable on the defendants. It becomes the defendant's uh, obligation or, or duty to prove that, what the act, that, that the actions are reasonable in the circumstances. So in the case of St. Helen's Smelting Company versus Tipping, we recall you know, that the, defend, the defendant's factory damaging the trees on the plaintiff's estate that was considered a nuisance. But as a result, uh, in that particular case, this case shows that locality is irrelevant to the question of liability in private nuisance for material damage to property. So um, if, if it were in a different setting, if it just involved interference with use and enjoyment of property and it did not involve material damage, then you might have to wonder, you know, is this based on the locality, is this an activity or an interference of property rights or usage? Uh, that what what that you might consider to be reasonable and acceptable in daily life. It is, however, different when it comes to material damage because when there is material damage to property, it will necessarily become um, the question of locality becomes irrelevant because of the material damage to the property. Every time there is material damage to property, in a sense, there is private nuisance. So. Liability for material physical damage does not depend on any of the factors that are relevant in ordinary use and enjoyment cases. So this was the other reason why there is, uh, it's considered that material damage is a distinct class or kind of private nuisance because issues about duration and extent and timing uh, of the interference, which were important when it came to uh, the use and enjoyment cases, does not apply when it comes to material physical damage because if it involves a material physical damage to a property, uh, there is, that constitutes straight away as a private nuisance. In the case of Kremers uh, versus Attorney General of Tasmania, the court said, uh, the Supreme Court of Tasmania said that where material or substantial injury to property is caused, nothing more need be shown by the plaintiff. The criterion the law applies to the plaintiff's entitlement to sue is material injury to his property. It is then for the defendant to allege and prove lawful justification in accordance with some recognized criterion of exculpation from liability. So the burden then shifts to the uh, defendant to prove uh, lawful justification for the damage. All that the plaintiff has to do with this material damage is to show that there is material injury to his property. He doesn't have to show that, you know, what the activities or he doesn't have to prove that the activities of the defendant are unreasonable. It is enough that the plaintiff proves material damage or injury to his property. In uh, Corbett versus Palace, which relied on the Kramer's case, uh, it is authority for, for the propositions that in a case of material damage, the plaintiff may establish a prima facie case of nuisance simply by proving the fact of damage. The plaintiff does not have to prove that the defendant's use of land was unreasonable and the defendant is then, uh, the burden of proof is then on the defendant to establish that its use of land was reasonable, in which case it has a defense. In Butler Market Gardens Proprietary Limited, this uh, is one of those cases, a number of cases stand, that stand for the proposition that material or substantial damage to property is enough in itself to establish a prima facie case of nuisance, thereby shifting the burden to the defendant to establish reasonableness. So 
in, in a sense, if there is material damage, there is strict liability in nuisance for the material physical damage, unless the defendant can establish that his or her use of the property was reasonable in the circumstances. Uh, in the case of Harris versus Carnegie's proprietary limited, the defendant held strictly, the defendant was held strictly liable for material damage to its neighbor's property. The rule that noise and dust interference during building renovations is not actionable in private nuisance if the defendant has taken reasonable precautions, but it does not apply where the defend the plaintiff had suffered material damage to property. So we've talked about um, private nuisance, both in terms of uh, private the kind of private nuisance which involves interference with the use and enjoyment of a property right or a property. And we've talked about material damage. The question then is who may be liable? So of course, in most cases, the person who creates a nuisance is the owner or occupier of the premises from which it emanates. So the person who creates a nuisance may be sued whether or not he or she is the owner or occupier of the premises from which it emanates. So uh, usually the question is who can sue? The one who can sue, if, if it's a question of somebody suffering uh, from a private nuisance, typically the one who can sue in a private nuisance claim is the owner or lawful occupier of a property or a tenant of a property. So a mere licensee in general cannot sue for a, on, a, on the basis of private, private nuisance. But when we talk about who is liable, anyone who creates the nuisance, even if that person is not the owner or occupier of a property and is a mere licensee for as long as he is the one who created the nuisance, he may be sued for the private nuisance. So the defendant therefore did not have any property rights in or over the premises from which the nuisance comes. So if you create the nuisance, even if you don't have the property rights over the property, you will be held liable for nuisance if you created the nuisance. Uh, in, for, so for example, in the case of Fennel versus Robson's excavations proprietary to limited, you have a defendant uh, who was engaged as an excavating contractor working on the property owned by a developer. So the defendant then here was not, did not have any property rights over the property. Uh, either of the of the uh, owner of the property in which the excavation was going uh, was was being done, or that of the plaintiff. The excavations, however, of the uh, of the defendant company led to subsidence of land on the adjoining land owned by the plaintiff. The question is, could the defendant, even though he doesn't have any property rights over any of the properties, be liable for creating a nuisance on someone else's property? The answer is yes. So yes, the defendant was liable in private nuisance despite the fact that it had never been in occupation or, or possession of the property where the excavation was done. So the court said that although there appears to be no direct uh, authority fastening liability on a complete stranger to the occupier of land upon which the nuisance is created, the weight of authority, it seems to me, attaches liability to any person who creates a nuisance while present on land with the authority of its occupier. So the owner or occupier of premises from which a nuisance emanates can be held liable as creator of the nuisance, even after he or she ceases to be the owner or occupier of the premises. So in the case of South Australia versus Simeo Nato, the plaintiffs con uh, complained of damage uh, caused to their land by tree roots encroaching, encroaching from the property which was formerly owned by the defendants. So the court said that a person who creates a nuisance and then who then disposes of the land uh, cannot thereby avoid the consequence of the nuisance. So even a former owner can be held liable for the nuisance. In this case, though, uh, the, the defendants were not found liable for private nuisance by the court, mainly because the nuisance, meaning the encroachment of the, of the tree roots, had not yet happened at the time they ceased to be the owners. But had there already been an encroachment into the property of the plaintiff at the time that the defendants were owners, then they would have been found uh, liable uh, for private nuisance. So who else may be liable? So the owner uh, or occupier of the premises from which uh, a, a nuisance emanates may be sued in respect of that nuisance, even if he or she did not create it. So even if the owner or occupier of the premises was not the one who created but the, uh, the nuisance and then became, becomes aware of the nuisance but does not, does not do anything about it, that owner or occupier, even if 
uh, he or she did not create the nuisance can be held liable for private nuisance. So in the case of Sedley, uh, Denfield versus O'Callaghan, uh, there had been water that overflowed from a blocked pipe laid by the council on the defendant's land. And the defendant was not uh, did not even give consent to the actions of the council, which was considered to have involved a trespass on the defendant's land. But at some point, the defendant was aware that as a result of the blocked pipe, as a result of the pipes laid by the council, which had become blocked, uh, and then the defendants did not do anything, it led to damage uh, to the plaintiff's land because water overflowed from the, the blocked pipe. The court ruled that the defendant is not liable unless he continued or adopted the nuisance, or more accurately, did not without undue delay remedy it when he became aware of it, or with ordinary and reasonable care should have become aware of it. So under these principles, the occupier of premises may be liable for continuing or adopting a nuisance, even if it were created by a third party. So we've talked about uh, the two kinds of private nuisance, and we've talked about who may be liable and who can sue. Uh, we need to talk about remedies now. So there are uh, at least two kinds of remedies available in private nuisance. One is injunction. The other one is uh, for, one for damages. So injunction is a usual remedy, and this is a remedy which seeks an action in private nuisance to restrain the defendant from continuing the interference. So it will be if the injunction is granted, the court will order uh, the defendant to cease and desist or restrain, be restrained from continuing with the interference. Uh, before the trial of the action, the plaintiff may also seek an interlocutory injunction. So in other words, it, it is an injunction prior to a final determination made by the court. The plaintiff may also seek an interlocutory injunction to restrain the defendant from continuing the interference until the trial, usually, uh, this will involve a requirement of uh, having to prove that on the balance of convenience, it will, uh, the balance of convenience favors that uh, the plaintiff be allowed the interlocutory injunction. It often also requires that, uh, that the uh, plaintiff provide a security that in the event that it turns out that the uh, injunction should not have been granted in the first place and it leads to harm or damage to the defendant, then the plaintiff will have to pay the defendant for the damages. Now, because of that requirement of uh, there being a security that has to be provided by plaintiff prior to trial as part of an interlocutory injunction, and imagine if you are a plaintiff and you know, you're trying to restrain a, a, a manufacturing plant from continuing to operate, you're asking the, the company to stop. If the company or the manufacturing company stops its operations, it can lead to you know, hundreds of thousands or even millions of dollars in losses. Now, if it turns out that there was no private nuisance and the defendant suffered harm, the plaintiff will have to compensate the defendant for its losses. So, and, and as a reason, a lot of plaintiffs will not seek an interlocutory injunction because it can be pretty risky for them in the event that the action for private nuisance is eventually denied by the court because they would have to compensate the defendant uh, for uh, damages that it may, it may have. Now, also in exceptional circumstances, the court may grant a quia timet injunction, which is to restrain a threatened nuisance. In other words, even though there is no nuisance that exists at that time, if the, there is a threatened nuisance, there might still be an injunction in the form of a quia timet injunction. Now the other one, the other remedy would be damages. Um, equitable, da equitable damages are awarded for an injury still in the future. The plaintiff may recover damages for all reasonably foreseeable consequences of the nuisance for which the defendant is liable. Now, of course, we know about common law damages. They compensate the plaintiff for past interferences or damage. And where the nuisance has affected the market value of the plaintiff's property, the diminution in value provides the primary measure of damages. And where the nuisance has not diminished the market value of the property, the plaintiff can only recover nominal dam damages for loss of amenity. So damages, uh, where the defendant is liable for continuing and adopting a nuisance, any award of damages should only reflect the damage or interference caused after the defendant became aware 
or ought to have become aware of the nuisance. In the case of Valheri versus Strata Corp Corporation number 1841, the award of damages should reflect only so much of the damage caused by the nuisance that occurred after the defendant began to continue or adopt it. So we've covered uh, private nuisance and uh, we'll briefly talk about public nuisance. So the essential difference between a public nuisance and a private nuisance is that the former, meaning the public nuisance, affects the public at large. But when you speak of a private nuisance, it only affects specific private individuals. Now, because a public nuisance affects uh, the general public, any action against the defendant in respect of it must prima facie be brought by the attorney general on behalf of the public rather than by a private individual. So if it's a public nuisance, which affects uh, you know, uh, the general public, it's difficult for a private individual to assert uh, and claim that uh, the, the, uh, nuisance, the, the action for public nuisance should be initiated or commenced by him or her. Because prima facie, it's something that uh, ought to be commenced by the attorney general on behalf of the public. In the case of uh, Attorney General versus PYA Quartz Limited, though, the question is, when you speak of uh, the public at large being affected, how big is a public? How many people have to be affected for there to be a public nuisance? Uh, this is also a crucial point because what we need to remember is that in terms of the private nuisance, the one who sues uh, in an action for private nuisance must prove or show or demonstrate that he or she has certain property rights. Uh, so when you speak of a certain property right, it's a result that of, of, the, uh, of the plaintiff being an owner or legal occupier or even a tenant or a tenant of a, of a land or a property. It's not sufficient that a person is a mere licensee, meaning a person is merely there upon you know, the, the permission, with the permission of the legal owners. So because of that, the question in public nuisance, it's different because there is no need to show in a public nuisance, assuming it were an individual who initiated a public nuisance, and we're going to get into great detail, detail into this in a short while, if it's a public nuisance, there is no requirement that the plaintiff uh, has uh, is an owner or legal occupier of tenant of a particular land. There is no requirement. Okay, and we're going to look at this in a short while. But going back to the question of um, when you speak of public at large, how la hard large how large has the public got to be? How many people have to have to be in, uh, in affected for that to be considered, uh, for a nuisance to be considered to be a public nuisance? And the court said that I declined to answer the question, how many people are necessary to make up Her Majesty's subjects generally? I prefer to look to the reason of the thing and to say that a public nuisance is a nuisance which is so widespread in its range or so indiscriminate in its effect that it would not be reasonable to expect one person to take proceedings on his own responsibility to put a stop to it, but that it should be taken on the responsibility of the community at large. Now, so the question was, could private individuals sue even if they are not owners? And the, and the ruling has been that private individuals do not have standing to sue in respect of public nuisances in general, unless they have suffered particular damage over and above that suffered by the public in general. So in the case, for example, in Owners versus Teltra Corporation Limited, uh, the defendant Teltra Corporation intended to create a 35 meters telecom tower close to the plaintiff's airfield. Now, of course, with the construction of an airfield, um, and with the construction of a 35 meter telecom tower, it does cause an interference uh, with the user enjoyment of uh, people living in the area. So it wasn't just going to be the, you know, the, the plaintiff who owned and operated an airfield that would be affected. But the question was, could, if this was considered to be a public nuisance because it affected you know, the public at large, could the defendant sue uh, on its own behalf and that the, the uh, action for public nuisance did not have to be commenced uh, by the attorney general? The answer was yes because in this particular case, the plaintiff suffered particular damage which was over and above that suffered by the public in general. 
It's also important to know that unlike private nuisance, it is not necessary for the plaintiff to have property rights in or over land in order to have standing to sue in public nuisance. If she or who he has suffered particular damage, that is sufficient to give him legal standing to sue an action uh, on public nuisance. So at the end of this module, you should be able to explain the differences between the two actions of nuisance, identify factual scenarios to which the separate actions of public and private nuisance arise and apply relevant legal principles and briefly explain the remedies and defenses available to actions in private and public nuisance. And with that, I thank you for listening and watching uh, this lecture video on nuisance. My name is Manjo Eisen, and I hope to see you again uh, during the tutorial in the coming days. Thank you. Bye.